The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, welcoming you to the eighth collection of entries from subscribers to the Orchestration Online website. Don't get comfortable, though, because there are a ton more to go. There are as many website evaluations to go in eight more of these collections, and I am actually completely ready for that. I'm enjoying the hell out of myself, and... Every single entry seems to be saying something different. There are so many different approaches. And at the end of the previous collection, there was an entry that was very ingenious, almost devious in saying different things constantly throughout. And this entry is very, very similar. I really enjoyed looking at this Pierre Dominique. And there's, there's so much to talk about, so many things to say. So let's just get started. Right at the beginning here, uh, <clears throat> I have talked a little bit about uh, possible problems with uh, this kind of scoring approach, this kind of bowing approach, but it's fine. Uh, I'm not going to bring that up here, but what I am going to talk about is that once you have set up this bowing regimen, you do not even need to say this. You do not even need to have this here, right? The, the, the players will understand it. You don't need to put it here. It's all, you know, they will get the fact that when you have these four notes in a row, that that is what is intended from that point onwards. So you would only need to tell us to mark a different articulation style when it would be changing, right? So otherwise you don't need to, you don't need to continuously Right. You, what you might do is just say simile or sim. You don't need to write out the entire word sim, period, on the first note. And then that's all you need to say. I'm a little, um, I'm wondering why you didn't do that for everybody here. Like, if, with the, why are the cellos not getting the same treatment? All right. Let's continue on with looking at just an overview of this score in light of the evaluation criteria. And, you know, the, the very first concern in the criteria, uh, the pitch weight being in the upper middle register of the orchestra and the thematic material perhaps repeating, you know, perhaps getting repetitive if it's cop copy pasted. Those issues are not a problem because you are varying things even just in little two bar phrases right you are you're changing things around and uh, i love the way that you get lower and lower <laughs> that's very cool um i'm kind of wondering whether or not the the brass could have also jumped lower right because as it is here they're supporting uh, the the strings with their overtones, right? But providing some rich context below, some rich harmonic context below. And then here, the uh, strings are diving into the same territory, 
and then the overtones of the brass spill out above, right? Rather than supporting the strings in the same context that they did. So what you could do here is you could just get lower with all of your brass. And uh, maybe it would sound a little muddy, maybe a little murky. Maybe you could take out a couple of voices uh, in, you know, maybe you could just do it with um, just with your trombones and maybe one or two horns and you know, just lose a few voices in your in your uh, your accompaniment, your harmony, just so that you get the same effect as you did before. Okay, but otherwise I'm not going to quibble. So just looking at the treatment here, um, you know, pretty much a transcription of what happened before plus the octave cellos, um, a transcription of what's in the piano score. And I really love this, this is really effective. Uh, here I think this should be a big roll. Okay, and you should not you should not mark your harp mezzo forte when anybody else in the orchestra is doing something at forte. It should be fortissimo. If anybody else in the orchestra is playing forte, the harp should be louder, right? It should be marked louder so that you have any chance at all of hearing it. Now here you did not put anything in at all. Once again, um, uh, triangle is very similar to harp, and so is celesta. Like they're very soft instruments. So uh, you know, the harder you the louder you get to getting a, a, a loud, or the, the harder you try to get a loud sound on triangle, the more it is kind of a jangly, kind of a clinking sound or a clashing sound, which kind of takes away from the whole idea of the triangle. So I would say, uh, um, I mean, it would be better if this was mezzo forte and this was forte, right? But you could mark this fortissimo and at least forte on your triangle to try to get some kind of balance here. I really love the way that this is scored, though. The um, the flutes, the piccolo, all of this in harmony, the bass clarinet going toot, 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 toot. That's very nice. And then here, um, yum, 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 yum. And then the lower winds, bum, 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 bum. And at the same time as you're going dun, 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 you've got this rising line into this next part. Yep, bum, 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 da, 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 Now, this is interesting. You solved the problem of the melodic development soaring quite high by just dropping, right? You just like drop down again. Um, so here you've got the parts tracking in octaves, and then here you just have a unison on the lower octave. And it is completely excusable because A, that's your decision, and B, you're setting up this lower restatement of the opening melody, right? And then this is so cool. You have the lower strings responding. Uh, you know, boom, 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 boom. Here's where I would say if you have contrabassoon, throw it in, right? Just just have your contrabassoon doubling that lower line and you just get the, just a total solidity. You do not actually have to have this doubled by bassoons. But, I mean, you could if you want consistency. But just to have just a little bit of extra weight down there and clarity. And I don't think you need to do this, you know, dun, 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 dun. I don't think you need to have the, you know, loud going to mezzo piano. I think you can just drop off. I, I, I can see, you know, that you don't want it to, you don't want the sound of the, the, the weight of this to, um, to spill over into the next bar. But I don't think that that is as big a problem because you've got the support from the brass and you've got the intensity of the fourth string playing from all of these instruments. Right? And, and I think you could also, like, if you really want that focused sound, you could you could say right here, you know, uh, four in Roman numerals or, you know, uh, sol C, right? So just, just keep everything on the C string throughout here and then you get a matched sound from all of your lower strings. And, you know, as I said before, just drop the, drop the harmonic level or the, or the, drop the pitches down so that they support from below rather than at pitch. <clears throat> okay, so jumping back to here, we have the concern about the accompaniment figures covering a wide range uh, of pitches and wind registers and so on. You get around that just by having it in the strings. And it's kind of interesting that you've got everything slurred, uh, kind of nicely slurred. I would say just have the slurs. Um, oops, I see what's going on here. 
just have the slurs all be on the same side. It's just easier to read for your players. Even if the slur gets a little bit, you know, a little bent. And this is kind of nice. This sort of forte, uh, piano crescendo to forte and back. It's, there's not a whole lot of time in which to do this. <laughs> you know, da 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 da, da. I mean, they, they, you know, they're they're probably not going to get much louder than mezzo forte, but just I would just just say leave it written the way that it is. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then continuing on the the same concerns here. Um, it's just very very simple, smooth rise all the way up to the high E, and. What's cool is contrasting these two sections, you ended up not going very high at all with your melody here because you were leading to something lower, and here you're going high. So there's there's a beautiful contrast between these two sections as well. And then I love the doubling in here, uh, violas and cellos uh, with English horn and bass clarinet. There's a wonderful team up there, and it, you know it's just very intense the way that you've scored out the melody here. Uh, bum 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 bum. We, we've got uh, piccolo, flutes, uh, flutes and oboes. Uh, by the way, you know, right in here, the flutes are really in a in a very weak part of their their range uh, compared to the oboes. Right, the the oboes are going to completely dominate here, and the the piccolo is going to be very hard to hear. But that is okay because you are headed somewhere. Right, you're just eventually going to end up very very high. So, so that's all right. But just don't expect a whole lot from the uh, the flute and the piccolo, right at first, uh, and then yeah, uh, clarinets. Um, yeah, by the way, how many clarinets are playing here? Is this a two? Is that a two? Right? Is this a two? So, um, as I've mentioned in previous evaluations, especially recently, uh, it's it's sort of like punctuation, right? That's it's. Um, you know, it's it's sort of like you know, having the effect in a sentence that something was plural without saying they at the beginning, right? So if I don't understand that it is them, it is the bassoons who are doing this, right? So here you're saying unison. Uh, unison is a string marking. You want to say a ah, too, okay? So unison is something Berlioz and his publishers put into his scores back then. The whole idea of of the way that winds were being used was developing very rapidly, right? So this is kind of, this is just something that you should say for strings. Say ah too, you have to tell us how many bassoons are playing on a single voice, right? Don't, don't say unison. That's something more for like band parts where you have many clarinets playing at once or, or many flutes playing at once, not just two or three. Okay, and yeah, this is all fine. You know, the way that it's scored. Yep, wonderful unison solid scoring. It's like the castanets feel a little underpowered, especially right in here, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and that's partially just the um, the mock-up. They'll they'll cut right. They'll cut through beautifully in the um, in a regular performance. I would say mark them again um, because you have a passage right in here where the dynamics change a lot. So. Um, you know, if you have a tacit of four bars and things drop down to piano and, and so on, and there's, there's there's a lot going on with different registers and so on, the percussionist needs to know exactly what to expect. Now, of course, they'll probably just continue on at fortissimo, but what if you didn't want that, right? So I would, I would say mark it fortissimo again. All right, now here we get to a really beautiful section right in here, and I have been avoiding talking about celesta and harp scoring until now. I just thought I would save it to here. At this point, we get to the whole upper middle register relentlessness and so on, which is not an issue because of the beautiful changes that you've had throughout the score. Um, so uh, there's beautiful contrast here. Uh, you're going yeah, bah, 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 and then dun, 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 dun. so I would say like right in here it would be almost good to put in like a like to have everybody end on an on an eighth note just to give just a teeny bit more space for the harpist to start uh, without 
so much reverb. And, and you, you might actually notice in some recordings, especially older recordings, when you have a passage like this where you've got like some massive thing happening and then it's followed by some so very softer instruments. Sometimes the, um, the conductor will put in a little bit of a pause or a little bit of a, of a comma, right? Just a, just a teeny bit of a breath in there so that the player comes in without all of the reverb of the hall covering their part. So, you know, that's something that you might feel here. I would say don't interrupt the the pacing of the rhythm here, but you know, if you can just stop on a on a briefer uh, rhythm just like say like an eighth note staccato, right? And that, you know, and then if the if everybody just really really does stop their the resonance of their instruments, then that gives some space for the harp to come in here. And I would say solo, absolutely solo right in here. And the player could be playing fortissimo too, right? You know, just to have that really intense, um, uh, just much more engaged plucking. Now, <clears throat> right in here, like the only problematic thing that we've got going on here. Um, I mean, besides these high Fs in the oboes, I mean they're they're playable, but they're just not very they're just not very nice, um, you know, just not very nice sounding. So the only problematic thing, of course, is like the weight of the trumpet, the weight of these winds. Um, you know, you'll you'll hear the end of the harp, but that's it, right? So if you know, bum 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 bum. This note right here, this one single note here on the trumpet is enough to make it very hard to hear the celesta. So I would say mark the trumpet at like mezzo piano, right? Mezzo piano to the mezzo forte of the winds, right? And then maybe lighten this up a little bit. Don't just have like, you know, maybe have like piccolo, flute, uh, a second flute doubled by first oboe, and that's it, right? So just, just take some of that. You know, just make it a little cleaner, right? And if you have to have trumpet from below, make it make it softer. You know, it could even be piano. And then you're just, you know, you're dropping the octave, dropping, um, actually dropping two octaves when you consider it. And uh, yeah, so so like you're you're making trumpet the top voice all of a sudden, right? So you just have to think like, is that what you want? Bum 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 bum. Right. So I, I like the fact that it's controlled, but we've got like no guidance here in your trumpet part. Like what's the dynamic here? What's the dynamic there? I need to know. And especially in a situation like this, so critical. I mean, there is so much suspense about like what is going to happen here. So save the raised hands at the rehearsal, right? And just tone it down a bit. And um, yeah, of course, Celesta should be marked forte. And you don't have to mark both staves. Okay. If you're concerned about your uh, your playback, then just select your dynamic and uh, type uh, Option or Alt Five, right? And notice that this changed from dark blue to light blue. This means that this dynamic now will affect all of the staves of the instrument, and then you can just erase this one, which is which would be unnecessary in any case. Same thing here. So you know, let's delete this just to show you again. Select the dynamic. Okay, and I'm going to bring in the keypad so you can see what's going on here. So notice, I selected the dynamic. It is voice one. Now I'm going to type option five on my Mac keyboard. Notice it goes to all, right? So all is the light blue color. All right, and that's the proper way to mark dynamics in a grand staff. Okay, so <clears throat> here you go to just straight um, uh staccato strings here and leading to the next section so so that's all fine maintaining a driving staccato transitioning smoothly into the next passage i don't know what it would be but you know i would assume that you would be doing something kind of fast and furious with your strings so that's all good i would say the one thing that this lacks though is any kind of uh, dynamic flux right so um and and also it's not a smooth dynamic transition right this is this is coming in it's going to end up being soft here right so maybe it needs to start soft as well, right? And you can lose the accent. So uh, soft and then crescendo maybe to mezzo forte or, you know, or forte and then diminuendo out and then whatever dynamic you intend for the next section. So 
Anyways, yeah, such a cool score to start this particular group of entries with, and just you know hugely enjoy this, uh, and you know just giving me so many ideas. Uh, I I sit down with these scores at the uh, <clears throat> at the beginning of the process when nobody knows what is going to you know nobody knows what the what the uh, entry is going to be what the what the material is going to be for each of each uh, challenge. So I sit down with the piece of piano music that I've chosen and I score my own version and I you know I'm just thinking like what would be most true to the voice of the composer and what would be my ideas and just adding it all together and I score it all out and then you know the rest of you know when I get to the evaluation process I just see how you know the ingenuity of everybody and how many more ideas there is no perfect way to orchestrate any piece of music, right? There are just different ingenious ways, and this proves that more than anything. Uh, one last little thing is you do not need to import all of the articulation marks from a piano score. You can use your own judgment of what accents to include and so on. Um, you don't, you know, things don't have to be over-accented or over-emphasized all the time, right? And you've you've gone away from that to a degree, but you know you might be able to leave out even more. I mean, I don't think there's any need to overemphasize the the beginning of each of these beam groups. All right, so really great entry. Now on to the next one. This is a really fine score, Bruno, and I'm so glad that I'm getting a chance to look at it. You have a few notes here. Um, one of these talks about uh, taking the first horn, horn player up to C. That is actually not a problem, but it works in with the proportions. Like that's uh, one of the things I think that we can work on together in this score is balancing the proportions. Um, and it's not just the proportions of balance. Of, of dynamic balance, but it's also like the proportions of, of um, <clears throat> elements in the score. You say bass trombone. I know this isn't in the original. Good. Good it's not in the original. Good. You do not have to do things that are in the original score. You can add whatever you like, and in this case, strengthen the score. Okay, so um, let's talk about a few things. Uh, here you've got glockenspiel, you've got harp, in you know taking kind of a, a fairly um, a fairly important role of doubling certain elements right and especially in like the the um, harmony part from below so the glockenspiel has got a chance of being heard here it's kind of strange you got a forte diminuendo to mezzo forte diminuendo and so on um, yeah like in it like you've got this sort of grayscale text or grayscale dynamics, um, or it's actually hidden dynamics, but I decided to leave the um, um, the viewing option of seeing hidden objects. So yeah, I, th I think you should, you know, if you, you really are going to go like this, you should mark it, right? If, you, if this is really what you intend is for everybody to get softer, then that's fine. But then, you know, how do you justify this uh, um, <clears throat> forte entrance right in here if everybody else is mezzo forte. Maybe you're balancing the, you know, what you're hearing in the mock-up. So, all right, but the main point is, um, is inaudible harp, right? So, so right in here, yeah, I mean, marking the harp fortissimo, that's great, but if you really want it to contribute something to this, then the dynamic of all the other parts has to come way down, right? So maybe you could like finish on a fortissimo on the downbeat, and then from there, like just jump down to piano. 
and continue on from there. And then the harp could actually contribute something that would be meaningful, right? Um, and, and same thing in here. Like, you know, if, if you really want the harp to contribute something in, in these spots right in here, then the, the rest of the music really has to be soft. Um, you'd have to have a terrace dynamic here. Um, you know, right, with the harp plucking in there. So otherwise, like, the harp just has no chance. And, uh, you know, even even supposing that there, that the, it was a little bit more exposed so that, like, you could hear the harp better, it would still get swallowed by the viola pizzicato, right? It was just so much more strong than the, um, than the harp uh, plucking. We've got um, a similar concerns over here with uh, pizzicato in the middle strings and um, and then the uh, the plucking of the harp and the a two oboes and so on. So those ten, those those elements will tend to absorb the sound of the harp into them. So the harp doesn't really have much of a chance. <clears throat> now, I'm going to talk about the evaluation criteria in just a second, but. The thing that I sort of wanted to point out with the uh, percussion is that I kind of feel like the same elements are getting used a lot, right? So, um, so you know, we've got castanets going throughout. We've got tambourine going throughout. We've got uh, cymbals, right? I thought the cymbals were the were the element that were. Um, Kind of just just felt overused, and it's not just because the um, you know because note performer or playback. I've got note performer one, but um, you know, tell me, please let me know if this has been changed by note performer three, whatever the current version is. But yeah, you know, the cymbal sound is just really sounds like a crash cymbal from from a drum kit, and you know that is that is one of my pet peeves. You know, it's, how how many years has it been since Sibelius? started to have playback of Sibelius 2 I think that was like uh, 2001 2002 something like that and we've still had a crash sound from a drum kit I mean come on come on folks I mean that should be that should be concern number one right and and I just was so disappointed you know like if, if you were to if you were to ask me like what what were you disappointed about no performer was that you know that the, the symbol sound did not sound I, I think Sibelius, um, the Sibelius um, sounds, when they came up with their own um, sound set, they had a more realistic kind of a symbol, but they didn't really have any variation between suspended and and clash symbols and so on. And yeah, so um, they really improved the bass drum sound, but not to get too distracted by that. But yeah, so I just I just feel that even even setting aside that kind of uh, banality of that sound. I just feel that there just is so much symbol. It kind of distracts. Like there's there's so much percussion that it kind of the individual impact of any one percussion instrument is is diminished, right? So um, like for instance, right in here, you know, this is just solid thump right in here. We can't really, you know, there there's no bass drum to really help conspire with that. We just have the timpani continuing on this blump 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 kind of idea. So maybe the proportions need to be tweaked a little bit, right? I like this roll right in here. I think that's very effective. And I love the the glockenspiel coming in at the end. Okay, so so those were my uh, preliminary thoughts on proportions. So let's talk about the um, the other concerns. Pitch weight uh, in the upper middle register is not a concern because you you're expansive in your scoring. Um, thematic material possibly sounding repetitive if you are orchestrated the same exact way throughout. Um, you know, you're, you're addressing that. See here, you're, you're treating this as that might as it might possibly be a mistake, but no, that is right. That's fine. I would say actually octaves would be better here than just uh, doubling on this low E. So, um, and, and like also just be aware, an accented half note here, you're going to have bum, 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 and here it's just going to be bum, right? It's not going to be bum, right? So it's just really going to be kind of a braying sound. Uh, 
So you might want to think rethink this a little bit too, right? I mean, maybe E octaves. You know, you could even have like the uh, tuba play an octave lower and the bass trombone be on that nice solid E, solid E for the bass trombone. And you have like a quarter note accented to nudo, right? Just thump and throw in a bass drum right in there, right? Just, just, and that, you know, just that one little element is enough to differentiate these two parts from one another. Now here, um, there are a couple of things to adjust, I think, about the trumpet. Like here you have this ba 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 ba. Um, so it's, this is a little hazardous. I'm not saying it's unplayable. I mean, look at Schoenberg. He wrote stuff like this all the time for his first. But, you know, it's just, I mean, you're just really going up to that B and you're giving us some high Cs and everything else. And I think what you need to be aware is, of is just the power of what you are asking here. That trumpet is going to be so, just so aggressive. You know, you are not going to be able to hear the flute. Uh, you're not going to be able to hear the E-flat clarinet. You are just going to hear this massively pointy sound up here. And the, you know, the second trumpet is also going to swallow up this G sharp in the first oboe and, uh, you know, and so on. So, like, it's just going to be the the most bright uh, and, you know, and, and I mean, that is not even mentioning our uh, our poor little violins in here, right? So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, so this is the way to do this, right? So uh, this, this has come up in a few scores recently. Some, you know, some downbeats, some down bows. I think this is really cool, like, especially not having any grace notes, just having them going zoom, 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 zoom. Like when you... When you're thinking of a of a tenuto, this really is there is an implication of tenuto when you have a bunch of down bows in a row, um, and you know, and also at fortissimo. So yeah, so up bow on the on the end. It's not, this is almost almost superfluous, right? It almost does not need even need to be mentioned. And then you would just say sim. You don't need to write out simile. Just s i m period. And then people will get it from there, right? But <clears throat> do you want it here <laughs> is the question, right? So if you don't want that to continue on, uh, you know, just like I would say maybe go down, up, like, you know, or you... I'm just thinking, like, how would I... If I were concert master, how would I bow it? And then... Yeah, so, you know, what I would do is I would... If you're going to do this here and then say uh, simile, then here I would go down, up, down, and then just say etc. Right. So it just shows the player that look, this whole idea here is not going to carry forwards. And of course, we don't have to worry about it here because you've got the pizzicato, right? So, like you know, how well is all this orchestrated? Well, I mean, it's it's pretty nicely done. Um, yeah, I, I I mean, I don't see any huge problems. I love the idea of the E flat clarinet. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, you can always have like one, you know, you can always have like your E flat clarinet player and then two clarinets, right? You can always have two flutes and piccolo, two bassoons and contrabassoon. Um, it's okay to go to three players on these challenge entries. I mean, of course, you may have your own plans about this score. Uh, that include taking it to an orchestra and seeing if you can get a performance. And wouldn't that be great? <clears throat> I would definitely prioritize uh, any entry that actually got a performance and, you know, try to um, try to return to it and maybe have some have a few more things to say about it and definitely kind of uh, uh, platform it on across the community. So, you know, that might be a, a more incentive for people to perfect their entries. Okay, so uh, I I so want to talk about this, but I, I will wait. All right, so we get let's let's jump into our evaluation criteria again. Thematic material repeating often, sounding possibly sounding repetitive. You have kind of solved that problem with this these brash, just massive, massively strong uh, trumpets right in here, and this this very big um, thump from below. 
but I mean, it's it's still it really, you know, otherwise it's kind of the same approach. I, I think that also it really helps having Pizzicato and then Arco following. Our next concerns are the melodic development soaring quite high. And, you know, here, this, this is a pretty good way around that. And so Atu flutes would probably work better here than just a single flute. You know, so like that would be a strong argument to, you know, if you're really having, if you're having this much weight on the, um, on the, the violins from the, coming from the violins, then like a single flute is just going to give it a tiny bit of color and strength, but it's not going to be as much as if you had two or even like an, even an added oboe to sort of balance a little bit better. <clears throat> um, yeah, that solves that problem, right? And I, I love how you throw in the E flat clarinet right in here. That's perfect. And then, um, yeah, so here's what I was talking about. Um, I can't remember which entry had that possible concern, but you know, of just that uh, there was an entry where the flute just kind of came in or the piccolo just kind of came in cold um, right at the top there without anything leading into it. So here's a way that it can lead, that the flute part can lead in. So, um, and then right in here, you've got these octave um, octave oboes. You've got bassoons coming in a couple octaves below that. And then here you've got uh, first violins more or less doubling the, um, you know, kind of what's going on here, the same drop down and so on. And you've staggered it so that it isn't so obvious, and that's fine. There's kind of just a, a concern about that middle octave, right? So you've got, you basically have got uh, four octaves here. You've got first flutes and oboes leading to piccolo. You've got uh, second oboe leading to first flute, and that is more or less doubled by the violins. And here you've got the violas uh, coming in to double the second oboe right in here. Then you've got your Atu bassoons and trombones and trumpets working together. Yeah, I mean, so so it it all pretty much works. Uh, yeah, and then and then the roll from below. I don't know if you really need Atu trumpets here. You know what I mean? I think. I think this would be fine with just like first trumpet. So um, I've got a ton of things to say about this next section and I just keep seeing more and more things to say about it. So let me jump back and we'll talk a little bit about the accompaniment figures. Once again, I feel it's a little weak to give it to the harp if everybody else is loud, you know, you're losing most of the support from there. You would be better off if you if you have to be fortissimo here. You would be better off doubling these violas and cellos with some staccato clarinets and oboes, right? That would cover those pitches really nicely and bring them out to the front, rather than the harp that really can't the harp really can't contribute a whole lot. You know, it is never going to be louder than about mezzo piano, mezzo forte compared to a fortissimo orchestra. So even if there's lots of space. And, you know, just just even, in fact, doubling fortissimo uh, staccato or or pizzicato middle strings will just be enough to bury the harp completely. So then once again, we've got accompaniment patterns here. It's a little bit uh, a little bit better in terms of the um, of the doubling. Just yeah, I just almost feel like there could be more going on here. Uh, but anyways, I mean, it'll work. It'll, it'll work fine. It just the harp doesn't really have a lot to contribute either right in here. Okay, so now getting to this section, there is a concern about the uh, upper middle register being relentless. And that is not the problem with the way that you've got it scored. But there is a possible problem in the, uh, in the whole 
phrasing grouping that we've got here. So if we feel enough of a differentiation between this note and this note, so that this is the beginning of a new group of, this is the beginning of, of you know, a little phrasing groups that start on beat two and end on beat one, as opposed to just e e e e, which is not what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be end bum 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 da da dun dun dun, right? Uh, <clears throat> so so I think that you just have to. Um, you know, the, the 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 what worries me is that the melody notes that go that continue on are <laughs> you know are are at the same pitch with the other instruments, right? So yeah, so so that's one concern. Uh, the other one is like here, you know, you're talking about this being too high. It's it's partially, you know, part of the concern is being high, but part of the concern is basically shouting down. Like the the brass here are so loud. You've already got, you know, you've you've imported the accents from the piano score, right? So they've they're already accented and they're accented fortissimo. And they're very, very high, at least in the in the um, in the horns. You're going all the way up to this top C sounding F. So that is going to tend to smother the the strings and the winds, right? So I would say the first thing is, you know, why can't this top line be played by the trumpet, right? So you have have this little guy right in here, second trumpet, and this guy first trumpet, or or the other way around. They, the second trumpet can be a higher part than the first trumpet if the first trumpet is playing more of a melodic role. Okay, so so that's one that's one possible fix here. And then the whole brass section brought down to forte rather than fortissimo. And look, brass players do this all the time. You know, they know that they need to control themselves, but the way that you scored it right here. The brass players are going to get the idea that they are the main thing and everybody else is just coloring them around them, right? So you, you want to let them know that they are they are um, cooperating. They're working together with the other sections rather than really being the solo and the lead here. But, you know, the main danger really is just, just that the winds and strings will get blotted out by the power of the brass. So just bring everything down. Try not to have your horn scream so high because it's a very, very penetrating sound, right? And it's hard to get a controlled forte up here. The It's just going to want to shout and especially giving it all these accents and so on. So just bring it down, bring it down, back it off. Forte is fine if this is all fortissimo. And you know, just like in a general sense, you sort of need to think out your dynamics a bit, right? So forte crescendo to, or fortissimo crescendo to fortissimo, right? Maybe there could be like a dropping back here of the dynamics. So drop back to forte or mezzo forte, and then you have somewhere to come from. And then you're back at fortissimo again. And, you know, I mean, that's another, that's another uh, question about relentlessness, right? Um, you know, how, how much is this going to continue to dig away at the, at the audience's ear? All right, yep, up, 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 bum, 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 bum. And this is kind of cool. It's just a little piccolo comment from above. And then uh, going forwards, this is all real fun. Um, it's nice strong register for the oboes. You've got the harmonization from below, from clarinet, then trading off to bassoon. You know, it's a little strange. Ought to oboes, but I'm trying to see the context here, but a single clarinet and a single bassoon doubling down here. Yeah, it's that, that yeah, and then this on top. So. I just really feel the need for uh, for more strength in the harmony line and the and the line harmonizing from below. Otherwise, really, really fun score here, Bruno. I mean, 
yeah, there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of play. You know, there's a lot of um, there are a lot of things that are you know they need a little fixing, but there are degrees to which you could fix those things, right? You know, more or less, and continue to play with them. There's like it's not that anything is poorly scored. It's just more that you know really are asking a lot, and you will end up with uh, certain proportions and certain balances not quite working out, right? I, this isn't a score where I have to sort of break everything down and say you can't do this, you can do that, you can't do this. You know, it, was, it seems to me like you've got a pretty good picture of what you want, and and for the most part, kind of working. But it's just you know overbalancing on the brass. You have to sort of watch out for a little bit. You know, like for instance, right in here, this this screaming, these screaming high Bs and Cs really will just completely take over the texture. So, so yeah, so watch out for some of that high brass scoring when you are working with a 2T like this where the pitches that are being doubled are, are really quite close or the same, you know, uh, rather than an octave higher. Um, you know, you might be able to get the same exact effect that you, or the, the effect that you really want by dropping the trumpets down an octave here. And then, you know, the the suggestion of being higher in the trumpets may be enough to um, to give the illusion and then the support from below that these other parts need, and then the whole thing will feel strong. So I would say try that, see what happens. But anyways, just hugely enjoyable. Really love this, and uh, and thank you so much for um, for your your you know for this great entry for your you know conscientious way you approach this. Uh, apologies for strange sounds coming from the outside. There's, uh, it's sort of uh, mid morning right now, and so the world is starting to wake up outside my window on a Saturday, even though we're all on lockdown here, still in New Zealand. So, um, so, so thanks again, and now let's go on to the next score in this group. Okay, Panos, that is really, really great. Uh, really, really fun scoring. So, <laughs> so let's talk about proportions, okay? Because I'm, I seem to be stuck on that right now. <clears throat> and a few notes, right? So let's let's talk about guitar scoring and and orchestral scoring and harp scoring all together before I dive into the orchestration of this of this excellent entry. So uh, we're starting off here, harp fortissimo, and the harp is doing something similar to other other instruments and so on, the F double sharp. And Okay, the problem is harps cannot play double sharps. Harps are single action instruments, or excuse me, harps are double action instruments. They are not triple action instruments, right? So in order to move the F string to an F sharp, the um, the the middle position, the pedal is pushed down, so it goes to sharp, right? But it, it cannot go a further notch to F double sharp. So this is impossible, the way that it's scored. So this has to be a G natural. So the, the harp cannot play double sharps or double flats. Okay, so that's one concern. But the main concern that I've got here is that the harp just has no chance against the strength of the other parts for the first 16 bars, 17 bars, if you count this note. So so all of this beautiful harp scoring, you can probably you can notice in the mock-up too um, that you just really can't hear it. And if you can't hear it in the mock-up in terms of harp, in this sort of context, you just cannot hear it in real life. The harpist might be able to hear it, or the harpist might not even be able to hear themselves play, right? So you don't want to you don't want to ask a player to spend uh, an hour on your score learning a new part and then get to rehearsal or performance and they cannot hear what they're playing and neither can the audience, right? So that's just time wasted. So uh, 
the the only way that the harp could be heard in this situation would be if the orchestra was very soft, right? It was was like mezzo piano. If this section here was piano or mezzo piano and the harp was marked fortissimo, then you could hear the harp. Now here, um, you are conscious of the softness of the guitar, but one thing that you need to be aware of is that it's not enough for the orchestra to be soft. The orchestra also has to have a smaller uh, overall texture, right? Like you're throwing in brass, you're throwing in all the winds, and here everybody is doubling the the guitar line. So, um, you know, I, I strongly recommend that if you're going to be scoring something for a guitar, and you may be a guitarist yourself, right? So I'm not I'm not saying that you don't know how to write for guitar. But if you're scoring for guitar and orchestra, go check out some of the great guitar concertos uh, of the past, like uh, Concierto Aranjuez. Uh, that's that's you know by Rodrigo. That is you know that's kind of the pinnacle. And then there are some other works that you should check out as well. Uh, and I think there's some on IMSLP. So you kind of get a sense of the context of, of how the orchestra can accompany. So so right in here, for instance, you're running up to a, I think, fortissimo. So th these should all be marked fortissimo. And then from here, um, for some reason, you've got your cellos, piano, and then you have your other strings, mezzo forte. So have them all piano. Have all of your strings piano, right? So the, the proper proportion of dynamic between the orchestra and the guitar should be piano to forte, right? You, you need a, a wide, wide gap because the guitar is such a small instrument. And even with an amplifier on the guitar, it's going to be very difficult to hear it. That's the first thing. And then, and then in a situation like this, it might be better to have a full chord, like three full chords in a row, like of three to four strings, if not the entire guitar. You know, bram, 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 and then here some finger picking, pluck, 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 and then yeah, pa pa di da di da 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 da. So in this case, I would say have the lightest, softest instruments accompanying this, right? Rather than the entire wind section, I would say pick some some winds that can be very very soft. I would say at this point, you know, go to flute and uh, and clarinet, right? So, and just a single flute, say like, you know, one period. This is, this is another problem with this score is like when I get to a single line like this, I don't have any guide, right? Uh, shouldn't I have uh, some sort of number here to tell me if this is first flute or excuse me, first oboe? Or should you have this mark here, right? Is this intended to be two oboes playing at once? So you, you have to tell me those proportions, right? It's it's like writing a sentence in your language and forgetting to tell me if it's plural or singular, right? So it's it's musical punctuation. Like I need that kind of punctuation. <clears throat> so yeah, so I would say like in this situation, what if you had um what if you had bassoon playing the lower line of the um, of the of the like the harmony line, not contra bassoon? Right, you've got you've got everybody, you've got the entire wind section on the melody line, and you've got the contra bassoon playing the harmony line. Right, that's that's you know you've got one to I don't know. See, like if some of these are doubled. That could be one to eight. Right. So if you have two clarinets on this, two oboes, two flutes, because I don't know whether or not like you 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 have your interval here, so you you have two piccolos, right? Maybe you copy pasted this, like you copied this and pasted it on here, and you forgot to delete the a right there, right? So anyways, just be aware of some of those things. But. You know, I, I would say the flute is actually the best because the flute is a softer instrument in this register, and it won't 
it won't fight with the guitar. And then for the harmony line, just have that bring the contrabassoon line up an octave and then delete all the other wind instruments and see how that sounds. And then lighten this up right in here. You have so much support for the, the, the guitar here. Even if everybody is playing softly, it is so much doubling that it is the mass of sound, even at a softer dynamic level, is going to overwhelm the guitar. Okay, so those are some thoughts about proportion. And then, you know, as well, like this is kind of a guitar concerto interpretation of this, right? So what if the opening here, like if this is a guitar concerto, what if the opening here was just guitar or maybe a little bit of pizzicato and percussion supporting and the guitar was just going, you know, just like like flamenco kind of strums, and then the orchestra comes in, and then the whole orchestra plays this massive crashing thing, and then this leads to here, and the guitar comes back in, right? So, uh, so I, I, you know, that's a that's another way that you could make this more like a more exciting guitar-based piece. So let's just apply the criteria. You know, after I've made those suggestions. <laughs> We'll just stick straight to the criteria and see like what you did orchestrate and how that you know how that all applies. Pitch weight in the upper middle register of the piano, not a concern because you have a very wide scope to your orchestration. Thematic material repeating often, possibly sounding repetitive, that is a concern because they're you know you basically take the same approach with a few little you have a few little changes but not many changes right. So you know you you've got um, your, your your brass is scored a little differently, but it isn't scored differently enough to where these two sections sound really different from one another, right? They really sound similar. So dropping this down an octave and adding more horns is not really changing things around. What if you had less brass the first time and then more brass the second time? What if you didn't have so much of a solid, you know, like solid underpinning? From below and then you added more here right so uh, i'm not saying that you have to make both of these sections absolutely different from one another but whenever you get a chance to should you possibly take it right so that's the question and like you may regret that later like coming back to this and saying oh why didn't i say something new the second time around so just watch out you know use every opportunity that you can to to build on things and and make them bigger and better now this really, like this second trumpet part, it's perfectly playable on second trumpet. But I mean, looking how low you're pushing this all the way down to A sharp and A and so on, it really is more of a first trombone line, right? Um, this is strange, you're saying like unison solo, unison solo. So do not use the word unison in wind and brass parts. Tell me A2, A3, right? And then solo here. But then here you're like saying unison and then solo, solo what? You have two instruments here. That's not a solo, right? Soli, maybe, right? Do you mean... Is this what you mean? Or is this a copy-paste error, right? It's just the words were left over from here. Anyway, um, look. Yeah, solo means that this is a solo part and it's going to stand out against the rest of the orchestra and it's probably going to be played by one player, right? Unison should be used on strings. When you have divisi, and then at the end of the divisi, all the parts are coming back together. Don't use unison. Tell me, this this is what I think you mean here. Tell me A3, uh, right? So with three players. I think this is what you mean, right? And then here, like you would just say, if this really is a solo, like a like a part that is meant to be played, sorry, need to get this out of the way. If this is meant to be a part that is really played for its own, on its own, then one solo, right? Or if you just mean one player and it's not necessarily a solo, then, right? Now, did you notice on the playback how loud this was? It was so loud that the trumpet right in here you're saying marcato and it's and it's very big this was so loud on the on the mock up that i really couldn't hear anything else and i mean it's not surprising because you have 
Oboes playing the same exact pitches. By the way, this is completely unnecessary. Oboes are never going to read Atava. And you have plenty of room in your score to do this, right? So it's, it's not necessary to add Atava. Do not add Atava to wind parts. Yeah, and same thing here. Like, what's what's the what's the need? There's no need. Okay. Uh, and then you've got this contrary motion in here. I couldn't hear the contrary motion. Right? It's you know the the trumpet was so loud, was so powerfully loud. And you're going all the way up to high D here, hugely high D. You know, it's just it's you know that usually is. Three trumpets, three trumpets in in E flat. Yeah, I mean, so even in a transposing score, I mean, it's still. I mean, I can see why you did what you did, but then that's that is all the more argument for this to be a trombone line and not, you know, not a second trumpet line because a second trumpet in E flat could not reach these notes or yeah, this low F here and it would just be it would sound very flabby and inconsequential on this G and A. So I would say, you know, you could have your first trumpet like your you, know, you could have a specialist trumpet player playing the E flat and then the two other trumpet players playing standard B flat or C trumpets would be my recommendation here. And you know, and once again, I can't tell what's going on with the trombones. Is this two trombones, right? Would this be uh, something like this? Right? Is this what you intend? Uh, Due. Okay. Um, now moving on to the these other parts here. Um, Looking at the way that this is scored, uh, going way up high to this, you know, this this is all fine. Except, I mean, I think even with this, it's starting to get even a little high for the uh, for the E flat trumpet right in there. I, I don't know. I mean, I just the screamingly high solo trumpet is, you know, I'm I'm just not sure that that is going to work um, the way that you think it's going to work. But you know, certainly the harp cannot cannot uh, positively contribute there. Now, this doesn't mean that everything is wrong. Far from it. I mean, I think this is very very cool. Uh, if, if we go over to the accompaniment figures, like you have very very prominent accompaniment figures. Um, I would say maybe even a little much, right? Like it gets a little like right in here. This bum 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 bum. But it's sort of it. I think that this is taking away from the idea of the. Um, of this run going, just you know, the momentum, the beautiful momentum of rushing up here to this high E. Uh, I think the the timpani, especially the syncopated feeling of the timpani, really hold back the the freedom of this line rushing forward. And of course, in the um, in the piano score, it just stops here, right? The accompaniment stops right there, and then the music is allowed to rush forwards. Now. You know, what if you didn't have any harp and you just had a big glissando, like no harp here, but then you had a big glissando up to this E, right? Or maybe even an octave higher, right? Just up to the top E string of the harp from very low. That would really set things up, right? And then, uh, bum, 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 bum. So we've already talked about this a little bit. And, you know, once again, like if you really want your guitar to succeed here, you have to really back off on adding so much weight to the uh, to the winds even even at a soft uh, soft volume there's still you know you, you you know you don't need to put in the trombones here the the bassoons are fine right in there uh, you don't need tuba right in there the contrabassoon is fine um, I, I would say you know you can leave in these horns but you know just like take away the accents no you know, no more accents get rid of the accents when you are accompanying guitar. Let the guitarist play the accents and take away the accents from the wind players. You know, it's very easy to do that, by the way. You know, let's say you wanted to take away the accents from everybody in the wind section and brass section all at once. 
you just basically select that and then you click the accent button and then you click it again. Now we have no accents, right? Of course, I'm not going to change your score for you. You have to think about whether or not you want to do that. But anyhow, um, I, I mean, I think that you're onto something here with the whole idea of a guitar concerto. I think that's such a great idea. I mean, um, this a lot of this music um, by composers like Faya and his contemporaries, the people who came just before him, Albany and uh, Soar and so on, you know, like a lot of the things that they... Uh, I don't know if Sor wrote for piano, but like a lot of the the Spanish composers who wrote um, like characteristic suites, nationalistic suites for piano, were basically borrowing from piano music in a big way. So, um, so like to turn that back into, excuse me, we're we're borrowing from. we're borrowing from guitar music in a big way. So to turn it back into guitar music and a guitar concerto, I think is a terrific thing. But I would say, go for broke. Go further than you've even gone here. You know, like like I said, just start off with a guitar solo in here, really loud, just slamming that guitar in a flamenco way. You know, maybe like, you know, strum, 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 strum. And then the orchestra just goes, bam, dun, dun, dun. And then strum, 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 bam, dun, dun, dun. And then the orchestra takes off. And then what about if here you went, um, um, the orchestra going, bium, bium, bium. And then the guitar comes in, strum, yep, bum, bum, bum. And then the orchestra comes back in, blum, bum, blum, blum. And then the guitar comes back in, blum, yeah, dun, dun, dun. Right, so more trading off, more prominent guitar, more balanced orchestra, just really allowing the guitar to be heard. Um, and you know, it doesn't it doesn't matter. Of course, the guitarist is always you know nowadays the guitarist usually or almost always is amplified, but at that they don't want too much amplification. Right, it's not like they're playing electric guitar. They just have a little bit of a um, they just have a little bit of of a, of a box like right in the middle so that the so that they can be more organically heard against the rest of the orchestra. So anyway, uh, just a, the funnest score, you know, in terms of adding this new element in here. So, so yeah, so so just you know, think about this or maybe other movements from that work that could possibly be turned into exciting guitar solo uh, plus orchestra. And you know. Um, you know, if you are a guitarist, I would say just, just you know, expand out. Give yourself more to do, right? Because I don't think you're giving yourself enough to do here. And with that, <laughs> let's move on to the next entry. And thank you so much, Panos, for this excellent entry. Just real exciting, very provocative. Gave me a lot to think about. And now, continuing our tradition of really, really fun scores, we've got David uh, David's entry here. Uh, so, <laughs> just, just so much fun. Uh, okay, so a um, couple of comments, uh, David. I think you could have made your staff size a little bit larger here. Um, and I'm just kind of looking at it with my failing eyesight here. <laughs> if it were just up a teeny bit more, it looks like it's about maybe 4.5, um, like a staff size of about 4.5, kind of needed to be 5.1 or larger. Um, or, but maybe it is 5.1, but with the proportions of the page that you had. But anyway, um, just feels a little small. And the other thing too is um, like the, the mock-up there, like I, I just feel a little bit, um, you know, a little regretful on behalf of uh, our um, viewers who are not quite as um, uh, you know, some some viewers may not like be able to just look at this and see it and hear it. So um, 
they're not going to see how ingenious they're not going to hear how ingenious some of this orchestration is they're probably just they're just going to listen to that you know marginal sound set that you used and maybe judge it on that but just telling people that it's it is better than that you know the kind of cheesy soprano sax sound and and trumpet sounds and so on um it's the score the score is better than that okay it doesn't mean that i've got nothing to say and it's perfect I, i'm definitely going to give you some feedback but uh all that aside um really really enjoyable uh, and you know in very similar to the past couple of of entries it, you know very uh individual and and imaginative and fun you know really making things fun for me and that's good because um it's um that's that's really what it takes to keep me going is like it's just how fun and active and involved the orchestration is and imaginative and so on and it's definitely paying off um you might want to make sure that you have your um your bar line covering the entire section right so it's just some some basic proofreading stuff so let's just jump straight into the uh evaluation criteria and then spin off from there um pitch weight in the upper middle register not a concern you have a more widespread kind of scoring approach and in fact um, you snuck in a few extra bars there, or a couple of extra bars. <laughs> um, okay, you know, that's fine if people want to do that. Um, yeah, just so long as it doesn't add too much or confuse the picture of what's going on, then that's fine. Okay, <laughs> um, uh, but I'm, I'm still going to just marginally pay attention to what you did before. I'm giving you the, you know, I'm giving everybody the same amount of evaluation. Um, so just, you know, a few thoughts about proportions, right? And that is like the, you've got a really active percussion similar to in previous scores. And uh, I'm just wondering if like some, some instruments, tambourine or or cast nets or snare drum you know can um can work with others now here you're you're really staying um quite religiously and satisfyingly to the um to the parameters right uh your your instructions are a little late though right so if you want to go to snare drum here then this should be back here, right? And you don't need an, another, you don't need an extra um, clef, right? It's the same clef. So boom, and then on this rest, you say two concert snare drum. And then they play their little bars. And then on this rest, you say two concert bass drum. I don't know if this is something in Dorico because I've noticed this in a few other parts where the two text, uh, ended up being like on the change rather than before the change, right? So, or maybe people are just putting the change right before the uh, entrance. That's probably the problem. So just, you know, I would say just uh, calculate the the beat, you know, the first rest after um, the last note before you change and then make the change from there. And then you will have the text in the right place. All right, but you know, I mean, just it's just a hell of a lot of bass drum. Uh, really kind of, kind of takes over, um, you know, and just a lot of tambourine. So you might want to think about what parts go with what, you know, like maybe having specific percussion instruments accompany specific parts. Like you're doing that with your timpani. That's fantastic, right? Um, you know, just like a touch here, touch there, dropping out when it doesn't need to, this big roll, Right. So, I mean, I think that like you have a nice proportional approach to the timpani. So, you know, you don't have to have this constant, um, you know, timekeeping. Right. Because it, what, what that eventually does is it, it distracts away from the natural energy and momentum of your different orchestral treatments. Right. So you like each one of these is a treatment. Right. You are treating. First, you gave yourself a couple bars of intro. OK. And then you kind of get into it. This is like. These are, you know, bars one and two, bars three and four, right? You have a different approach. It's really, really great. Uh, similar to the uh, first, um, the first score of this group, I think. And then, you know, and then you've got this different part in here. And yeah, I mean, yeah. So, so like, so why can't the, 
percussion and reflect that as well, right? Be cued to certain things. Um, it's cool that you've got piano in here sort of being used as a, you know, more of that um, sort of Russian or American way of just like being as a, a, a resource of color and and percussive quality, almost like a like a uh, an alternate xylophone. And this is very cool right in here, too. OK, so if you have an Ottava line with an end on it, you don't need to say loco. Everybody knows, like every pianist will know that it has come to an end or that the dash line comes to an end. So only say loco if you don't have the dash line, right? So just Ottava, then loco. But like I would just say, you know, we don't need loco either. Just have the dash line and then it comes to an end and we all know, right? Okay, <clears throat> so now <laughs> let's dig into the score um, uh, a little bit more. Thematic material repeating often, possibly sounding repetitive, not a concern because you have so much differentiation between your treatment of different parts. Um, melodic, melodic development, soaring quite high. Uh, you know, here you, you, know, you have this beautiful soprano saxophone solo. Uh, it's kind of cool the way you have the oboes and the clarinets rushing up, yeah, ba 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 bum, and then the saxophone takes over, yeah, da 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 do do da 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 ba bum ba 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 bum bum, and it's nice because the that kind of slightly snarly nasal sound of the uh, saxophone, uh, you know, it has all of these overtones built over it, right? It's just sort of above, and then you know that gives the the hint of having higher pitches. I also like this right in here. This wonderful little bits of support that you're giving to the melody um, yeah, but by the strings. I think that's just wonderful and subtle and beautiful. It's just like one of those other things that's just like thinking, oh man, you know, if this were, uh, if the sound set for this were note performer, it, you know, there would be absolutely no question uh, yeah, of the quality from the casual listener. And you know, the, and you know that just has a professional aspect to it too. Like, um, I at, at the beginning of these challenges, I really avoided critiquing people's sound sets. But now I'm just really starting to realize more and more, and even just in my own profession, is like the importance of having a passable sounding mock-up in an orchestral sense. Because look, I've gotten four or five major jobs or, or, or threads of jobs, like, you know, like starting with the client on the right foot, right? Sending them a mock-up that is just really convincing. Um, and I've actually even had some clients who were working with more complex sound sets, go to note performer <laughs> and start using that, um, as for their own mock-ups that they end up sending me. And then I send them back a mock-up that's notated a little bit better and so on and so forth. So, yeah, note performer is cheap. It's um, you know fairly realistic sounding, and uh, and it's you know it does the job quick, and it's a good reference. Now I'm not saying that it sounds perfectly like an orchestra. That's not the point, right? The point is whether or not it is usable, and you get a gig, right? That's the bottom line. Do you you know? So um, all right. So <laughs> um, <clears throat> moving on uh, with more melodic development. Uh, you know we've got this. Continuing on, yeah, bu -bu 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 bum. I like the support from the piano right in here, the clarinets and so on, and then the little bit of flute coming in right at the end. It's interesting how the flutes are supporting the clarinets as they climb high rather than the other way around. And of course, soprano saxophone, which is really going to dominate in there. All right. Then over those same groups of four bars, the question of the uh, the capacity of the instruments to interpret the accompaniment figures. There's no problem in here with the viola and the second violins. And yeah, the only thing that I would say in here is like you've got this nice strong these nice strong octaves in here um, for your your um, you know these pizzicato octaves right in here uh, and. <clears throat> They're like a couple octaves apart, um, and you know, and then right here, like you just have clarinets and bass clarinet and second violins, and that's it. I think you need another string instrument in here. 
Um, so apologies if you're hearing my my boy shout in the background. He's um, I do have the two rooms more sound resistant, not soundproof. So uh, Saturday mornings are his day to go wild with uh, um, with his online crowd playing Minecraft. So uh, you may hear the occasional uh, shout of exasperation. But, you know, I like the way you come back in here. This is nice, the horns and so on. You really are just like throwing different parts to different players and so on. I like this right in here, flutes and oboes. All good, really nice. Um, and, and I love the little bit of bass clarinet coming in at the bottom here. And then of course, like this second, like second part or the second uh, accompaniment figure uh, is also done nicely. Uh, I think that I, I just think it's strange how you can you know you have bassoons and cellos doubling here but not here right and and also like it's probably better to um, to like not go to third I mean like it seems to me like you don't really need third bassoon right I think two bassoons will do the job. If you, you know, for a third bassoon part, just maybe contra bassoon. But, you know, like there's, this should be first bassoon or first and second bassoon, right? There's kind of really no need for a third bassoon player. You don't really need one and two on the bottom and three on top. It would be better to have one on top and two on the bottom. And that's enough. That's definitely enough of a, enough power. Okay, so <laughs> continuing on. Um... We get to this uh, part right in here. Bum, 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 yeah, da, dun, da, dun, 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 um, You know, so you're starting off flutes, soprano saxophone, and bassoons. So the so soprano saxophones are really going to dominate here. Um, I would say there needs to be a little bit more weight on the uh, uh, on this line here. There will be no problem with the top line. I, okay, I don't understand, like say, ah, two and then two. This should be first. I, I would I would continue with ah, two flutes or have first flute play, right? Let your first flute take the leadership role. Don't just trade off to your second player. Yeah, like right here, right here you have second, right? Uh, don't just trade off to your second player just to give them something to do, right? Uh, leadership role to the first and then support role to the second, right? Just like, just be really clear on what their roles are and ignore Dvorak's uh, love for his second flute player. Okay, and then, you know, here, <laughs> um, yeah. So, so fairly high scoring for the bass clarinet. Um, Yeah, it's just a little, a little strange. Yeah, so just I'm I'm a little uncertain about this, like the, the you know the the whole concept of driving staccato, and and the, I also don't know if I really go along with dun 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 dun. Um, sorry, dun 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 dun. dun, dun. I, I just think that this is very fiddly. The way that you got the accents here and the slurs and everything else, I just. It's just, you know, at that speed, it's a it's a bit, you know, it's a lot to kind of think about. And then, you know, this, like, the alternating support of, just like on every other note, of your pizzicato strings. Not sure if that is the strongest. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I see what you're doing here, but it's it's a lot of work to organize. You know, it's a lot of work to practice, uh, to, to, to prepare. And also, you know, just like dun 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 da 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 dun da 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 dun da 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 Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Well, you know, uh I'm not gonna pick it apart too much, but uh but there's some cool stuff in here. I like the uh roll here in the timpani. Uh I like this little solo trumpet part right in here. Uh that that works really well for me. I like the, you know, the, the different, uh, you know, sort of the trading off in the different, um, the different treatments of your orchestration here. Um, yeah, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, okay, so A sharp to B, right? Because the, 
you know, the A sharp is leading up to B, right? It's not, it's not a B flat changing to a B natural, right? So the functionally, this is an A sharp going to a B. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah, pretty much works. Yeah, uh, you know, just kind of hitting this, like this, this real high C right in here is going to be difficult. Um, I mean, it's totally playable by your first player, but you know, I mean, it's like, I mean, do you really need that right in there? It's really going to, it's going to be so dominant of everything that's going on in here. But you know, and and also that, like, you know, what what is really happening here is is you know the whole idea of e e e da 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 dum, right? So the whole idea of the e is going to be very hard to. Uh, to, to really like that the identity of that e as a as kind of a um a sort of a pedal within which the um the harmony moves that's going to be really kind of blotted out by the brightness of those high c's right just the i mean you would be better off with having lower trumpets and then having like first and second flute working together you know c um you know moving down b b flat right under the e would it would be better off as you know as just winds right with the trumpets below rather than like the um you know the middle like the c in the middle of that e octave is just really going to like change the whole uh proportions of the function right in there yeah so i mean there's there are a bunch of tiny little things to tweak I, you know but i mean overall like the just the innovations and the and the differences the variation between parts is just intriguing and and really really fun you know just something to look at and just lots of little bits and pieces like the little you know little clarinet coming in there and uh you know a little dash of bass clarinet and so on <laughs> one thing that i i sort of wish that i had seen would be like um like if you've got the saxophones and you've got these other instruments bass clarinet and so on um, wouldn't it have been cool to like create some kind of like little chorale or or contrapuntal part where bass clarinet, soprano sax, baritone sax, and maybe a two bassoons like work together, um, you know, maybe in four part harmony or in like like I said in counterpoint or some other kind of a thing, you know, like wouldn't it be kind of cool to sort of isolate some of these colors out or like having like the saxophones work with maybe muted trumpets. Uh, or with uh, with uh, trombones or something like that. I mean, or or to have like uh, like um, imagine the richness of the color that you could get with your lower winds here, uh, from bass clarinet down to bassoons, including the saxophones. A, a beautiful background color behind uh, behind string harmony, right? So, like, there's so many so many cool ideas. So like, um, so I'm not. Uh, putting down your desire to work with saxophones here, I think it's fantastic. So I think it could be even more so, right? Um, so, like, thank you so much for a you know very thought provoking score. Um, just really intriguing, gave me a lot to think about, and that's what I treasure about these challenges. They're just you know such such a rewarding group of scores in this. Uh, particular round or this particular little uh, group of evaluations. So on to the next score. Great score, Brian. Just, yeah, uh, once again, lots of innovation, lots of variation, lots of things for me to talk about and to help you out with. So first thing I would mention is if you ask your average percussionist, they will tell you that they do not like the um, the little symbols, the little ideograms, right? They, they basically don't like <clears throat> this stuff. They just want you to say tambourine, Maraca, or sorry, uh, ca um, castanet, 
uh, and here I would say symbol pair. Uh, now, now one little issue right here with symbol pair. Probably if the um, if you want this many clashes in a row this fast, then the player will probably get like the smaller Mozart symbols that like they use for. Uh, pieces from the classical era with just endless, <laughs> endless symbols like the abduction of uh, uh, the abduction from the seraglio has got tons and tons of um, percussion in it. You know, like <laughs> and so the player has got a small symbol sitting on their wrist, pointed upwards, and then above it they've got its partner that's got its match and they're just basically tapping downwards or kind of sw swooshing downwards with a slight um you know slightly um just a very slight clash that kind of that has some motion to it in the wrist so um yeah so like you wouldn't get a big massive pair going <laughs> because there isn't enough time for the for the plates to move apart and then come back together again so this is kind of a a maximum of speed for the bigger clash symbols. <clears throat> so, you know, that's one scoring note. Now, the other scoring note is, like, the approach that you took here with this, that's all you need. You don't need to write out the uh, the, diff the separate notes. All you need is just wiggly line from one to the other. That's that's it, right? Wiggly line or, or just like a straight line that says gliss the first time, and then the others can just be straight lines without anything. <clears throat> but I mean, the the harpist will just understand it, right? And like the problem with doing this is that you end up with like strange, um, uh, strange rhythms, right? So like for here, in order to get this, you probably hid some rhythms and so on. Uh, and and what you ended up with is like a quarter note, right? And that quarter note, the player is actually thinking of how much time they've got to go from here to there more than they're thinking of how much time they have to start from here to there. So they might, in a rush, they might mistake this for the third beat of a bar rather than the second, right? So this is so much safer, right? That's, a, that's another concern. Now, uh, the last concern I would say is that you are really giving yourself um, not, very not very many strings to cover in, um, in a longer span of time than you think. Right, so if you get from here to there, it's just, you know, it's almost a scale as slow as you're writing it, right? So it's better to go, right? So I would say take everything an octave apart. So octave lower with your F, octave higher with your B, right? And the same thing here, higher B, lower E, even two octaves down, right? Because you have a whole bar to get from here to there and then go an octave higher even to there, right? You've got strings all the way up to G, possibly, with some with some harps. So so yeah, so just like go down to low E and then up, and then you get this beautiful sweep, right? So I'd say octave higher, down to one or two octaves lower, and then octave higher way up here. And you just really are using up the different things. Now, okay, now so I don't know if you noticed something, so pardon pardon the screaming going on in the background. It's my my boy, he was doing something very exciting with Minecraft right now. <coughs> <coughs> so, one thing that you might have noticed on the mock-up <coughs> is there was a certain lack of clarity on some of these phrases, especially going here, you know, yep, up, 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 So when we got to here, the roll from the timpani and the tambourine and these glissandos and you know some of the contrary motion in here and just all of it put together was enough to obscure this very weak line right there's like almost nothing you've got you've got no support from any other instrument on this line so i'll talk about this a little bit more like transitioning smoothly into the next passage but just in an overall way coming to the ends of these phrases there was you know the orchestration didn't necessarily support the uh the melody the thematic line right there was a lot of stuff in the background that was kind of blurring it out so just watch out for those watch out for those aspects okay 
So <clears throat> now let's talk about the um, the evaluation criteria. And you know, just kind of starting off here, there's like there's nothing that is badly scored or anything like the the um, the scoring across the parts, the balance, and everything else. That's all fine. Um, I, I would actually prefer a score that is transposed rather than a score that's in C. Right? I'd like to you know I'd like to read what the players are reading. Uh, I do like, you know, this whole idea of, you know, ripping up to the sea and then, you know, yum, 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 yum. That's really cool. Okay, um, but we have one little problem here, and that is grace note pizzicato, right? So, uh, pluck, 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 pluck. I mean, how fast can this player, you know, how how fast can your players do that, right? Uh, it's It's just... You know, you can't you can't really slur it, right? Because those have to be separately plucked notes. And and how fast can they pluck from one note to the next note? And can they all do it together in a way that is that um, is really synchronized and and even, right? Rather than this little sort of pluck, 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 right? Is is possibly what you would get there with each player kind of how you know seeing how fast they could get from one note to the other right so i mean that's that's would be the general situation if your piece like had one rehearsal right like just like there's not enough time for people to kind of feel where where the whole orchestra is going with that and unless like they stopped and they took the time and saying you know can we go da dun da dun da dun da dun you know, right rather than da dun or from some players and da dun from other players right if we could just really get that synchronized so I would say that your um, your grace notes are much more secure and much more playable in your wins. And there's nothing wrong with having a grace note slur into a trillo, right? Right? It's totally fine. So I would say put the grace notes where they are the most playable and natural. And you know, if you're gonna have a trillo, don't put a staccato on it, right? Because you want your, you know, that like you're giving yourself almost no time to get the trill finished, right? So get rid of the staccatos. Uh, they, they're just really not needed. And then this will work together really, really well. Okay, <clears throat> now <laughs> we have the issue of like the criteria. Pitch weight is not a problem. You have massive scoring throughout. Uh, you have nice variation, right? You, you know, you've got your pizzicato here you got your arco there the the winds are basically scored kind of the same way I, I like this um these sort of triple stop uh triple stop grace notes yeah that's all pretty good you, you know here i would say you're going da -da -dum. here i would go just a single grace note like da sixth da sixth is better than going da 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 sixth or da da sixth Right, it's just, it's just, just a bit much. Um, okay, uh, now here, like you have differentiated between the sections. You know, thematic material repeats often, possibly sounding repetitive. That's not as big an issue here. However, the issue is that your brass is so huge, is so strong here. Even though it's not scored very high, it's it's still just really strong and really prominent. <clears throat> so it's going to tend to um, to outshout the winds and the strings. So I would say, like, take away the accents. That's the first thing, right? And we fortissimo accents is practically triple F, right? So triple F on the brass. It doesn't matter how loud the strings and the winds play; that they're gone. They're out of there. And especially since they don't have accents, right? And well, the strings have accents, but still. They have a much smaller part of the sound picture. <clears throat> so yeah, um, I would say take away the accents, take away the fortissimo. So forte is fine, right? Roll into this, that's all good, and then you'll have a much more balanced sound. You'll you'll hear it in your um, in your mock-up right away, right? You just play back that mock-up, and you'll go, oh yeah, right, okay, of course, right? 
Now my brass aren't too loud. Now right in here, you're running into yet another problem. You have mezzo forte pizzicato, right? Which is a, a just a much smaller sound. And you have staccato winds and, uh, and, and mezzo forte brass, right? So like <clears throat> maybe forte winds and strings and mezzo forte brass. And then you'll get a really good balance there. So let's talk a little bit about the other evaluation criterion of melodic development soaring quite high. Um, I, I really like this little rip up here to the piccolo. There's a lot of like kind of pushing, you know, pushing forwards, pushing backwards, some contrary motion. <clears throat> I like the trills. I just, you know, just, you know, it's sort of, it's almost like the, the whole place is on fire, right? So, so that's, that is cool. So long as it doesn't interfere with the clarity of the melodic, you know, of the melodic statement, which it, every once in a while it does, right? So you have to watch out for that. But you know, interpreting interpreting this pizzicato, you're you're pretty much covering you know the some elements of melody and accompaniment, and you know doubling with certain winds and so on, and that all works good. I'd say make sure that you've got a staccato throughout, and then don't put um, you know you've got okay, so you've got pizzicato and you've got arco uh, arco staccato, yeah. So so that's all fine. Okay. That's good. Um, now this is continuing on. There's some similar elements here. Pizzicato, this time in the middle and lower strings, or throughout the section. Um, yeah, so just yeah, just keep your keep your strings strong here, right? And keep your winds at forte, I'd say, and then mezzo forte for everybody else here in the in the brass. So forte, then mezzo forte. And then you'll get a nice balance, and it won't. <clears throat> this crescendo here won't overblow or over overblow. Wrong word to use. Will won't, won't overwhelm the other things going on here. And you know, once again, like this this kind of really integrated, uh, gutsy playing, especially um, with your with your uh, trumpets pushing up all the way up to G and so on and so forth. It's just really going to be overwhelming. So just, you know, crescendo to forte, right? Just keep them keep them a little backed up so that they blend right. So this should be fortissimo, right? And you're, you're missing some crescendo marks in your winds, right? So winds all crescendo to fortissimo, uh, like, you know, so for instance, like in your mock-up, you can hear the brass getting loud here. You can hear the harp getting loud. And you can sort of hear this line on the violins, but you can't really hear the winds all that well, right? So that's just that's a sign right there. Um, you know, even though mock-ups are not necessarily the most accurate uh, way of interpreting the um, um, the balance of an orchestra, that sometimes it does actually work. So, <clears throat> so right here. Um, You've got a marking. Maybe you meant to erase this later. So um, here you got your first player. So you don't need to mark a two here. So we know it's it's two. You know it's two notes on each stem. So intervals. So we know right away that that is a two. So like where you might need the a two marking would be right here, right, to let us know that we're or, or right here to let us know that we're going from intervals to a single <clears throat> um, a single line representing two players you do that here but the thing is like like there's no default it's like once you've done it you're not going to presume it's going to be the same way all the all the time so you just constantly have to remind us right um and, it, and if, if you're really just going back and forth between a single line and intervals and a single line and intervals all the time then it's better to do super two separate voices or even two separate staves <clears throat> All right, so if you can tame this, right? And this is kind of interesting. You go fortissimo here and then forte there, diminuendo. So I think it should be balanced throughout. So fortissimo, um, change to forte, and this is forte, and then diminuendo here as well, right? Because otherwise it's fortissimo all the way through with a crescendo. They just have really loud, you know, uh, it, I, I feel like they're, this, that this is just, 
just becomes too aggressive, even just in the winds and the strings. So have everybody back off. And, you know, this, these little rips from below, they're kind of fun. But they, they get a little much, right? A lot of the accompaniment just really starts to take over. And then we don't really hear this one single isolated line. There's nothing wrong with having the clarinets continue A2, supporting these last four notes. <clears throat> and more support to the um, to the other lines as well, right? It, just, it seems like there's so much going on here in terms of this these crescendo rolls and like the brass harmonizing and everything else that like we're kind of losing sense of the of the harmonizing line from below changing into a bass line and the line at the top, right? So so yeah, so there just needs to be more um, just more clarity in there, right? And maybe less um, maybe. I don't know about cutting out the fat, but just controlling it, right? Controlling its its presence in the music. But yeah, I mean, aside from all those little picky things, um, really, really enjoying um, all the variety, all the, you know, the, like this brass scoring in here, so much fun. Um, yeah. Just kind of checking through your horn scoring in here. It's all good. Yeah, and then then right here, you could just say one period, right? Um, there might be a one buried behind this dynamic here, but yeah. So just I'd say one. You don't need the second voice rest. And then here you're saying ah three, but I mean, what do you mean? Do you mean two voices on top, one on the bottom? One voice on top, two on the bottom. You have to tell us which ones are which, right? And then ah two, which ones like? So you know you can just say one period, two period on top, and then three period on the bottom. I would actually recommend first trumpet on top, second and third on the bottom. It's it's better to have the the lower notes doubled and the top note um, single, you know, <clears throat> solo. <coughs> It's just a, it, you know, it's just, it's better to have the two trumpets below supporting the single trumpet above. The higher you push unison trumpets, the more risk of cracking and just, and just like in terms of aesthetic and balance, um, the lower trumpet line is going to be weaker than the higher one, right? So there's just a lot of reasons to do things a certain way. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just, you know, the, the, the fatness of the tuba line down here compared to the scoring for uh, for strings and winds is, is you know just so much weaker, right? It's, it's very stompy right in there. I think you could possibly just lose the tuba or basically re rewrite both parts so that they're more in line with each other. Yeah, massive fun. So um, I will just stop there. I think that you have everything you need to proceed with this if you intend to or proceed with other orchestrations if you found any of my feedback to be useful. And you know, thanks so much for participating this year. It would be very interesting to see what you did with next year's, uh, next year's selection, which I've already picked and will be a complete departure from this kind of scoring. It'll be just really different. There'll be similar to one or two things that we've done before <clears throat> in mood, but in terms of execution and proportions and you know overall thrust, it'll be completely different. So um, with that, let's take a look at the very last entry for this group of evaluations. And our final selection for this collection, and actually my final selection for today, <laughs> my throat is getting a little sore, 
<clears throat> that is this score from Gabriel, and uh, it's really cool. I mean, it sort of starts off balletic, and it kind of ends symphonic. <laughs> um, once again, there's a lot of variation going through it. There are a few things that need to be fixed, but they're really easy to fix. Okay, so... Um, <clears throat> First of all, like proportions, I would say, I'll just, just have a very quick discussion about that. Um, there are some places where, like, you keep things strong, like the first time, and then the second time it gets really, very weak. Maybe you forgot to, um, to introduce these elements right over here. Like when you leave them out, there's, you know, it sort of takes out a certain part of the harmony. And the bum 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 bum, it just really becomes much weaker because you have left it out, right? Um, I understand the need to have some variety between parts, but I would say it would be better to fill things in the second time than to leave them out the second time, right? <clears throat> and there are a couple of other spots, but I won't get into them too much. Um... Then, in terms of harp scoring, uh, I think what you have got here would be better scored as pizzicato, right? Because even though you've got very light scoring here in terms of how many instruments are playing at once, the harp is still not able to really contribute much in this style, right? If you had big rolled chords, then that could possibly contribute. And also if the dynamic were softer, right? If you were to have everything marked fortissimo. I think it's a mistake to have your melody, you know, you've got B, 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 and then the melody, dun, 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 you've got it marked forte rather than fortissimo. I don't understand that. Then here you don't have it marked forte. So it's better just to keep it loud. Um, you don't really need to have everything accented the way that it is in the piano part. Um, so, uh, yeah, so sometimes the accents can unbalance your score, but... If you're adding accents, you're at fortissimo, and you have this kind of harp scoring, then it will not it will not contribute anything to the sound picture meaningfully. Same thing here. So, um, of course, if you had um, if you brought down the volume a little bit uh, in this part and in this part, and you had the harp part, you know, like I said before, playing big, huge rolled chords or little uh, figures on top or glissandos, there's a bunch of different ways that the harp can be heard, but this kind of um, this kind of scoring, it cannot be heard. However, your lower strings are doing nothing, and they could be contributing these ideas in terms of pizzicato, right? So this could be scored onto the cellos, and this could be scored onto the violas, pizzicato. Maybe the double basses could help out as well. And then I think things would come into clarity much, much better. And then you could just leave the harp out completely. Okay, so <clears throat> now let's talk about the evaluation criteria. All right, um, there is a concern um, about keeping the pitch weight in the upper middle register of the piano just exactly like it is scored in the... Um, in the piano score that, you know, it just after a while it starts to feel relentless. Now, <clears throat> you are introducing lower pitches from time to time, like right in here, in your harp, uh, and here in your trombones and so on, and then, of course, right in here with your tuba. So you are compensating for that sense of sameness, but... It, I feel that, you know, like, if you if you do go to lower pizzicato rather than harp here, then that, that takes care of the problem, right? And same thing here, like that, you know, you end up having a, a broader orchestral range than the piano score. Now, the thematic material, um, repeating often, possibly sounding repetitive. So, I mean, you've done things to avoid that, but... Like I said before, I don't know if they are the right things, right? If, the, if it's the, if it's right to drop out these parts. Maybe that you just forgot you were going to copy them and drop them on here and you forgot to put them there. Um, but, but I think that it's, it's a mistake to leave it out 
here. I think you should leave, if you're going to leave them out, you should leave them out here and then put them in here. <clears throat> but you know, you're doing, you're aware of this problem and you are scoring things differently, right? I would say if you're going to change this to pizzicato, then it should also be, it should also, there should be something like that here as well. Um, here you've got these lower trombone parts and that does add a new element. Uh, but it's, you know, the focus is really on these, these winds and strings working together, the winds and the violins working together. So unless that changes, unless there's some radical change from your brass or winds, uh, then, there, you know, then there won't really be a huge difference between these two, uh, these two four bar groups or four bar phrases. Uh, I mean, I, I really like this here, you know, I, mean, I wonder if this could have been expanded on by more brass going forward. Now here you have this lovely idea of these parts intersecting. I think that's all really fun. Uh, and it's a really nice lower kind of um, accompaniment uh, that, you know, to the to the melody that's going on. So I think that's acceptable. And then here you um, you make it more lively. <clears throat> you know, the only thing you're mi missing here is that the, you know, the eighth notes give the accompaniment a lot of uh, vitality. And you're cutting that out and you're just letting the, um, the winds be the winds and the strings be the fast parts. So that's okay. So long as you're willing to sacrifice that, um, that uh, sense of momentum from the accompaniment. Now here you have a uh, more aggressive accompaniment, but I think still, you know, you should add more going on from your, like, if you change this to pizzicato, then that should reflect a doubling of what's going on in your first horn, right? Just that bum ba ba bum right? It should have that, that same, uh, and there's no reason why the, the lower winds could not help out as well, especially bassoons or bass clarinet. <clears throat> now, the next a concern is the melodic development sorting quite high. You've got piccolo, two flutes. You are doing a really great work with them here. It's exactly uh, just such a great way of scoring them. <clears throat> now here, this is a little strange. You end up on the A and you stop and you don't catch the A on the way down, right? You just come in here on the F. And I think you could keep the, you know, you could go bum, 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 bum. And then you could drop drop down to D and go D C A bum bum bum, you know I think that that rather than just having the violin stop, which I think that the stop here in the violins will be heard, rather than than them being just wrapped into the doubling that's going on here. I think that there will be a sense of so I think that you need to keep the violins going um, in some way. But you know, marcato. I mean, this is all this is all good scoring, and I like the I like the difference in the timbral qualities, the support of the horns. I think that's all great. It's a really good way of breaking things up. <clears throat> now, um, only comments here is like it's it's kind of the same thing twice, except just sort of staggering the octaves, right? So here you you're starting off with the piccolo um, and two flutes. Is it is this meant to be a uh, two? Right, you don't, you're not, you don't quite tell me all the time when you're changing from two voices to one voice whether or not it is two instruments playing one voice. Right, so that's something to to think about next time. But okay, so let's assume that it is a two flutes. Right, so you have a two flutes doubling the first uh, violin part and then changing to octaves here. Right, as the second line comes from below. Then here you've got your piccolo and two flutes in octaves. And your violins below by another octave, right? So you have your triple octave. Uh, and there's there's really no need for the second violins to come to a stop here. They could be going They don't need a, a rest in order to jump down to that C and play the B. <clears throat> so yeah, da 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 Right, so you don't want to go to the high E here. Clarinets coming in. Yeah, so I said this is this is all right. You know, it's kind of fun. And once again, I feel that like taking the accompaniment idea 
adding some pizzicato, maybe backing that up with some staccato bass clarinet or, or, or bassoons will make this much more lively. Okay, now here we get to the fun part. This is this is what I feel like where I feel that the the arrangement really starts to click. <clears throat> so first thing I have to warn you is if you are starting at the beginning of this bar with this kind of chordal accompaniment, and you are running up to this to this E and just sort of sitting on that E, you are in effect continuing this phrase, or you you know you're changing this into running up to the beginning of a new phrase, but the phrase the second phrase starts here. It doesn't start here, right? So this completes itself on the downbeat. Now the new rhythmic phrase is here. Two, three, one, two and three and one, two and three and one, two and three and. Do you see? So by just running up to this E and staying on the E and starting on the downbeat with a with this um, uh, this uh, harmonic accompaniment, then you are um, you're, you're basically telescoping the you know you're, you're pushing the beginning of the phrase onto the downbeat right and I think that it's sort of it it just becomes the same thing as before right you know the b b b b right so you now you have e e e e yappa da ba dum right so it it it's just, it sort of loses its individuality um, now here I would say it's better just to end on a on a um, on a quarter note, brrr, boom, because the hall, the concert hall, is going to provide the uh, the sustain, the resonance. Okay, so um, just letting the letting the uh, drum head continue to vibrate. Uh, I, I don't know if that really adds anything to what's going on in any other part. Okay, um, but you know, here we got there. Our e e e ba 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 bum. Uh, I like that, you know, that sort of the little alternating line right in there. Okay, it's nice, doubled by the seconds. Um, and then you've got these octave violas. Bum, 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 bum. It's funny that you just really hold off on doing anything with your lower strings at all until right here. I think you could add more, right? Like, as I said before, pizzicato or, you know, um, some other opportunities to fill things in. Now, just a, just a quick comment, um, and that is right here you have this little solo line, and you're trading off from first to second to third. So don't do that. Just have this all first player, right? That is their job. That's their, you know, they're being paid to sit down and play these lines just absolutely perfectly. Um, and, you know, they, they have, they might be paid to have more rehearsal, right? To actually, you know, that might be more part of their salary, of their you know, of their paycheck to be spending the extra hours on it. And you also can count on them to be able to play this with, you know, as close to perfection as you can get in a, you know, in a professional player, rather than just tra trading off from player to player, right? So, so I, I would say like, there's, there's, there's no reason why these other players couldn't play that, but you'll get an unevenness of line as you trade from player to player, because you don't have, <clears throat> you don't have dovetailing, pitches and also it's just it's just a lot to go you know like I mean, if you really want the sense of lines trading off trade off to other instruments right you could trade off to clarinet you know and or you could trade off to like english horn or oboe or something like that on or a two oboes or something if you really want a difference difference the sense of difference between lines but here i would say just give the whole line to your first player <clears throat> All right, and then, you know, so this is all fine. Yeah, bum, 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 bum. Uh, and I just like this, I like this uh, emphasis boom on this downbeat. That's nice. And yeah, bass clarinet and, yeah, that's all good. All right, yep, bum, 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 bum. This is neat, the way that you've harmonized this right in here. Okay, uh, I would say, just really make sure that you maintain the um, the difference in dynamic, right? So you have fortissimo, and then you have the trumpets behind it at forte, right? You could even start off mezzo forte in your instruments and then crescendo because that would, you know, that just gives the gives life and emphasis and articulation to the to the tone without um, without dominating it too much. There will still be a tendency to dominate. 
and this is all really cool the um the clarinets coming in from the top right at the end and yeah these lower winds doubling the cellos and so on and this is just so awesome the um <clears throat> the use of the um your your lower uh brass right in here lower heavy brass so i would say um you you couldn't hurt the music at all to double this with the double basses just really having them you know woom, 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 just like you know really bowing each accent and then ending together on the c anyways right just just as it is here and you could make that an accent rather than a staccato and then ending on this b and you don't have to you can have at least one of these instruments uh playing that b along with it right just so that there's more support from below anyways wow just you know so many things to look over and pick over and and you know some such strong uh, little ideas and asides and and other kinds of things and and um you know, I mean, I think a lot of what I pointed out to you would just be apparent, would become apparent to you anyways, after you heard this rehearsed, right? You, you would just say, oh, yeah, right. <clears throat> Harp isn't loud enough. Let's throw in that pizzicato instead. Maybe a little bit more support, more consistent. Oops, did I leave this out the second time around? Uh, maybe make the brass a little bit bigger right in here. Um, and... You know, I don't really need a, a dotted half note there and, and so on. You know, they're just, just, you know, some very basic little fixes, really. But, you know, such a strong score. And, you know, all of the all of the scores in this particular group just really had a lot of life and vigor, vigor and variety, color. Just, you know, I mean, it, that's what I live for, right? You know, the two things that I live for is the variety and and how that sort of gets me to comment about it and talk about it and look over the way that things work and how I could help you make them work better. And then also like the comments that people leave below. So, you know, Gabrielle, you know, please take the time to comment on the, on the contributions of the other people on this, uh, on this video below in the YouTube comments and, uh, or on Facebook, if that's where you are watching it. And, you know, to uh, the other people on this, comment on Gabrielle's um, uh, entry and on your on each other's, right? Like, wouldn't it be great if every one of these videos had comments from every from every person in the video on everybody else's uh, on everybody else's piece, right? And you know, the other thing is, it doesn't hurt to thank the people who have given you a compliment or given you a suggestion that's productive to you. Uh, that doesn't hurt either. So, so just really strong work. And just making it worthwhile for me. So keep up those comments. Keep up the great scores. I, I just really appreciate it. And so far, I'm really looking forward to 2022. Even though I know it's going to be a lot of work too. I'll probably get, I'll probably get 200 scores that time. But, uh, but it will be worth it if you guys just really jump in and help me with this. And help me keep the energy alive with comments and likes and and feedback for each other and uh and you know that will just be you know that will help keep this entire thing going for years thanks everybody and i should see you in about a week for the next group evaluation